we are very happy to to receive uh, Nima Akonihamed today, and he will talk about one of his uh, recent papers in collaboration with Lorenzo Behar, Yuting Huang, and Sebastian Mizera. I and see another two collaborators there, <laughs> Panerji and Hillman. Uh, welcome, Nima. <laughs> All and right, please, well, it's really wonderful to uh, be able to join you guys. Um, and uh, my, uh, um, uh, I, I saw that, um, I, I hadn't noticed, but then, th then I saw that, uh, that this talk had the tremendous luxury of having 90 minutes for talk and, and discussion, um, which uh, any of uh, those of you who might know me might already be uh, terrified what that might mean. But I'll, I'll put you, uh, uh, your mind at ease. I, I do, um, uh, unfortunately for me, but a big sigh of relief for all of you guys uh, have a sharp cutoff at 10, 10, 10, 30. <laughs> but not, not, nonetheless, um, I decided to like slightly broaden it and talk about a, a few other things um, in this uh, uh, general neighborhood as well. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll, uh, uh, it'll largely about the, be, be about the sort of uh, uh, original, uh, the, the subject of the original title of the talk. Um, I wanna just say uh, something about my um, uh, involvement in this, uh, uh, sort of uh, entire subject. Around five or six years ago, uh, in some discussions with the Yutin Huang, we started wondering whether it might be possible to sort of discover string theory from the bottom up, um, <clears throat> at least putting in some assumptions that you're looking for uh, amplitudes that give a UV completion of the scattering amplitudes for gluons or gravitons um, uh, at tree level. So that puts a big restriction on what the amplitude should look like. They should only have poles. But if you want to come up with some amplitude that at high energies softens um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the low energy growth of the amplitude for gravitons, let's say, and you demand all the physical um, constraints of causality and unitarity at tree level, which are very simple to uh, impose, could it be there's only just a unique function out there that satisfies all those constraints, um, uh, simply putting the constraints just on the massless uh, particle states that you're scattering. Anyway, that's, uh, and that, that led us into uh, trying to understand how, in fact, the known answer in string theory does satisfy it and how, how, how uh, uh, of course, it's well known in many ways, but we started uh, appreciating as well how, how uh, miraculous it is. Um, and that particular program it actually failed. It failed for an interesting reason that I'll uh, review in a second, that there's actually counterexamples. You can come up with other things that satisfy, at least for the massless uh, scattering states alone, all the consistency conditions that we know and love that are very close cousins. They're built around the objects we see in string amplitudes, but they're not literally what we see in uh, uh, string amplitudes. Um, but I think the sort of general question, the general spirit of the question uh, remains alive. It's possible we have to impose more conditions. We have to talk about uh, the consistency of the massive uh, uh, scattering states as well. Um, and so that's a sort of a fantasy that we might actually be able to derive from the bottom up that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, these amazing amplitudes, especially for two to two scattering that have an enormous degree of uniqueness to them, independent of how you compactify and so on at tree level, um, might actually be the unique answer to some, uh, some well-posed physical and uh, mathematical question. So that's the sort of big, big picture. Um, uh, for, uh, uh, for at least why I started thinking about these things. But again, we're gonna spend a lot of time in the stock just seeing precisely how string theory does satisfy these conditions kind of directly, as directly as possible, sort of starting from the answer and seeing how miraculous it is that in fact does satisfy. So um, here's a, a rough uh, outline for what we're gonna talk about. Again, my, my understanding is that the uh, spirit of these um, uh, discussions and more of a journal club and a discussion. This will be a very informal talk. I'm, I have no agenda. We have, don't have to rush through all of these things. Please interrupt, ask questions as we go. And again, um, uh, in the spirit, I'm really going to try to explain in, in somewhat technical detail what's, what's going on. I mean, I won't go through every step of algebra, but I won't leave any of the logical steps out. So, um, uh, so if, you, if, uh, if you don't want me to do that, you know, someone can put up their hand and say, you know, go, go faster. If you want me to go slower, tell me to go uh, slower, interrupt at any time. Okay, so um, I want to begin uh, by talking about, uh, again, just this idea of how we might discover strings from the bottom up um, and, uh, and emphasize that the really most magical thing uh, is actually the consistency with unitarity. Um, this is something which in the conventional, you know, ways of doing string theory in textbook is related to, to my mind, is still quite magical, non-trivial, and to my mind, not still especially conceptually understood fact about the no-ghost theorem. 
Uh, so, of course, all of these things follow from the no ghost theorem ra rather indirectly. Um, but, but we're going to just see in a way that you could explain to a high school student uh, how absolutely magical it is that these amazing formulas with gamma functions are actually compatible uh, with the unit therapy. Um, and in, in investigating how to sort of directly prove uh, that the two to two amplitudes are consistent with unitarity, which is uh, as, as we'll uh, see in review and is very standard, just a statement that when you sit on a pole, <clears throat> you should be able to interpret the residue of the pole as a partial wave expansion. I mean, an, an experimentalist who had access to the Veneziano amplitude or any of these amplitudes um, would, would, would think, okay, I'm sitting on a pole, I'm exchanging a bunch of particles and I have to be able to interpret it with uh, uh, particles with high spin uh, produced with positive probability. It's that fact that the residue has to have an expansion in terms of Lejeune polynomials or more generally in, in D space-time dimensions, Gegenbauer polynomials with positive coefficients. It's that positivity, which is uh, contains the physics of unitarity and it's that positivity, which is just a miraculous mathematical statement about um, uh, about our favorite, uh, 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 the residues of our favorite amplitudes. And so uh, what we're gonna try to do is try to directly understand why it's positive. And you'll see that it's maddeningly difficult to kind of find a straightforward um, understanding for why these residues are positive. But, um, uh, and that's really where also where Yutin and I were stuck for a long time until our, our uh, you know, wonderful uh, uh, young friends um, in this collaboration introduced some really new ideas uh, that led to a striking, at least to me, quite striking new contour integral representation of the residues of the amplitudes. Now, quite apart from the, now this, this is a new and interesting representation uh, for, the, uh, for the residues of the uh, uh, four-point amplitudes. Um, it allows you to very easily prove directly in this way that we wanna see that the amplitudes are unitary when D is less than or equal to six space-time dimensions. And all, not all the way up to the critical dimension of 10, but at least up to D less than or equal to six. And uh, for any particular level at which you wanna check uh, unitarity, there's a finite amount of work, even up to D equals 10 to uh, prove that it's true, but it's less uh, manifest. So things are still not perfect, um, but nonetheless, this new contour representation is quite striking and it might be of independent interest to try to understand conceptually where it comes from. Um, I'm going to give you a very non-conceptual understanding of where it comes from, a very mechanical derivation with a little bit of magic in the middle. There's some sort of somewhat magical identity in the middle allows something simple to come out of what looks like just a, a big mess. Um, uh, perhaps and hopefully there is some actual conceptual understanding for where this uh, representation comes from that might uh, teach us something interesting about, uh, uh, about uh, something interesting and new about representations of string amplitudes. Okay, so that's, that, that's really the sort of topics uh, that were there in the, uh, in the original uh, title of the talk. And if, if we have time, I wanna say a, a few other things. Um, again, other aspects of uh, uh, string amplitudes that I've been thinking about uh, recently with this uh, cast of characters. Um, one is a very basic one, which is why is it that uh, um, uh, string amplitudes at high energies uh, are exponentially soft. This is one of the most sort of famous things about uh, string theory, but it's, all, it's equally famous that it's not just um, a blanket fact that if you go to uh, high energies in any way you like, the amplitudes are exponentially soft. You have to make the Mandelstam invariants large and Lorentzian. Okay, so I have to really be physical. In the physical region, the amplitudes die exponentially, and in unphysical regions, they grow exponentially. So it's not some sort of blanket fact that string theory is soft everywhere. Um, in fact, uh, if you did make something stupidly soft everywhere, it would, it would, it would be in violent contradiction with uh, causality. Um, so it's sort of crucial that it blows up some, in some unphysical region for it to be allowed to die exponentially in some other region. But it's just an interesting question. What in this, what in this question of where the amplitudes are exponentially soft somehow knows about the fact that the signature for the Mandelstam invariant should be Lorentzian, that the momenta should be Lorentzian? Um, so there turns out to be a very simple explanation for that. Uh, and um, uh, so I'd like to say a few words about that. And then finally, if we uh, have any time uh, left after that, I wanna talk about a few open questions. Uh, uh, again, in, in this neighborhood of um, uh, uh, scattering, not just the energy is higher than the string scale, but really it's higher than Transplankian scattering, um, where we expect the physics ultimately to be dominated by the production and decay 
of black holes. Um, and there is an ancient question many people have uh, talked about, uh, lots of work has been done on uh, 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 over the years on how the kind of high energy string amplitudes are expected to morph into the even more exponentially soft amplitudes that we should get when we get black hole production. But I wanna talk about a few new aspects of this, which I think are interesting and perhaps uh, 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 string theorists might be um, uh, interested to uh, think about more again. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, I can stop at this point to ask if there are any questions, although since I haven't said anything with content yet, uh, perhaps uh, there aren't, but if there are. Okay, so let's start with uh, start uh, with part one. And this is just the, some, some generalities on how it is that uh, uh, just thinking about the question of UV completion <clears throat> for, uh, for Yang Mills and gravity amplitudes, uh, you might uh, uh, run in to you know, trip over uh, strings just from the bottom up. And I actually want to begin with a question that uh, you, know, you might have uh, had even um, you know, as a high school student, early college student, um, which is maybe a little funny. Why is it that the, the gravity, which is the most obvious force in daily macroscopic life and the first interaction that we started describing responsibly in science, um, why is it the one that continues to be the hardest to understand, the hardest that you be complete, while these much more hidden and esoteric seeming things like the weak interactions that were discovered at the very end of the 1800s took more or less half a century to understand and be uh, UV completed and so on. It's a little bit funny. Um, and uh, the answer is that this is yet another aspect of the sort of famous UVIR connection that we have um, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, gravity. Um, although as you'll see, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it's uh, it's really about the presence of long-range forces. Um, so uh, let me contrast the uh, uh, situation with, um, for example, the scattering of pions or the longitudinal components of W and Z bosons in the standard model. Um, if we look at these uh, scattering amplitudes for pi pi scattering, uh, the sigma model has a dimension full coupling constant, one over F squared, the same units as G Newton. The scattering amplitudes grow as the energy squared, same as in gravity. Um, but in this case, if, if someone told you you have this amplitude that grows like S uh, at high energies and said, how could you sort of UV complete it? Well, you'd say, I just wanna fix it up in some way so the amplitude doesn't keep growing at high energies. So let me, let me just, I'm just gonna play. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take S plus T and I'm gonna write, uh, multiply by S by S times one over S minus M squared and T by one minus uh, T over M squared. Okay, uh, that's good. You have now fixed it in the UV. So, so as now S and T become very large, the amplitude doesn't get large anymore. But now you have to make a check. Now you have to check that uh, you've introduced the pole. That pole has to be interpreted as the exchange of a physical particle. Uh, and it has to be exchanged as a uh, physical particle with positive probability. So that means that the residue on this pole has to be the sort of product of two coupling constants. So the residue has to be the square of something. The residue has to be positive. And indeed, the sort of imaginary part uh, is just the cross section for producing this uh, particle. And so that means that the coefficient of this pole, um, which, is, the, which is, is the imaginary part, when I take the imaginary part, I get delta of one minus S over M squared. So that means that the, the, uh, that, that the coefficient has got to be positive. And in this case, it is positive. Although you see positive for a kind of interesting reason that there's a minus sign in this low energy amplitude. And because of the minus sign in the low energy amplitude, uh, the residue on the pole here at S equals M squared is positive, <clears throat> okay? Um, in fact, you can turn this around and say that, uh, that, that you can use that to sort of predict the fact that the coefficient of this residue at low energy here has to be negative. Sorry, the coefficient of the coupling at low energies has got to be negative. You had no a priori reason to expect whether the sign was positive or negative, but from this argument, you actually say that the sign has got to be negative. Okay? And what is this? This is, of course, nothing other than the sort of Higgs completion or linear sigma model completion of this uh, nonlinear sigma model. So it's utterly trivial to tree UV complete uh, this uh, theory. <clears throat> but now let's do a different example. And uh, I, again, I stress that really it has nothing to do with uh, gravity per se. It's really the presence of long range interactions which means it's the presence of fundamental three particle amplitudes, three particle couplings is the sort of culprit for what, what's gonna make things a little more interesting. So um, 
so let's uh, just to avoid all other indices and polarizations, let's really imagine we had something like a phi cube theory. So the amplitude uh, would begin at low energies like d squared, one over s plus one over d plus one over u. And let's say for some reason you were unhappy. This amplitude is still too big at infinity. Uh, I mean, technically speaking, of course, in four dimensions, this is fine. But uh, in, uh, you know, above uh, seven dimensions, this is still uh, an irrelevant non-renormalizable coupling constant. And these are still growing amplitudes. Okay, so, uh, so in high enough dimensions, things are always bad. And so you might say, well, can I somehow fix this so the amplitude gets even softer as I go to uh, high energies? And so let's try the same strategy as before, just to see what, what, what happens. So can I go and just do the same idiot thing that I did before to multiply the one over S by uh, uh, one minus S over M squared similarly for T and U. And now you see the answer is no, you can't do this. Why can't we do this? Because now you see, um, what, what, when, I, when I say that I softened it, that, uh, uh, so uh, I have no choice in what the coefficient of one over S was here to begin with, because the residues at zero energy or the massless residues have to have the correct sign. Once the massless residues have the correct sign, these massive residues are forced to have the opposite sign. Okay? Or yet another way of saying it is if your point, uh, if the whole point is to soften this uh, object at uh, high energies, by Cauchy's theorem, the sum over all the residues has got to be zero, even after you multiply by whatever power of one over S that you want to, uh, uh, that, 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 that you want to have as your, uh, as your softness. Um, and that means that the fact that the low energy uh, residues are positive forces some of the massive residues and high energies to be negative, okay? So that's pretty interesting. Um, and it tells you that if you have a theory that does fundamentally contain three particle amplitudes and therefore it has long range interactions, so the two to two amplitude already has poles, unlike the sigma model where the two to two amplitude is just a contact interaction. Okay, if your amplitude already has poles, then it's simply impossible to give a UV completion uh, at tree level. In other words, come up with a formula that only has poles um, in terms of uh, rational functions. Okay, it's impossible to tree UV complete it with a finite number of particles. Um, you have to have an infinite number of particles, and uh, uh, and you and it's actually easy to extend this argument to show that you have to have an infinite tower of spins as well. Okay, so without saying anything else, uh, just from these very general arguments, you can see there is something special precisely about those theories that give you long range forces, which are the ones that we could have had a chance to detect 400 years ago. <laughs> okay, it's exactly the things that give you long range forces that are guaranteed to be uh, the theories for which it is difficult to give a simple UV completion. And any UV completion has got to be a tree level in this way has got to be fancy. It has to have an infinite tower of particles and an infinite uh, tower of spins. And so we're already in the neighborhood of something that looks uh, stringy, at least very roughly stringy. Now I wanna sort of keep going to say how if you never knew about the Verisor Shapiro amplitude or something like that, how you just, if you continue along this line, it's really the first thing that you would write down. I'm not saying it's a unique thing that you would write down, you'll see what the argument is, but I just want you to see how sort of natural it is that this uh, uh, object with the gamma, gamma, gamma over gamma, gamma, gamma could emerge from this kind of uh, thinking. So let's look at what the two to two gravity amplitude looks like. I'm just doing it in four dimensions uh, <clears throat> and um, I'm using uh, the, the uh, spinner helicity variables to keep track of the polarizations of the gravitons. But anyway, this is a famous formula for the tree amplitude for gravitons. And again, uh, there's this one over STU downstairs. I wanna stress something here, which I think is not uh, uh, widely appreciated enough, very simple fact. But you'll notice that these, uh, that already the, just the gravity amplitude, the, the field theory amplitude, nothing stringy here, does not look like a sum over channels. It doesn't look like something in S plus something in T plus something in U. The actual amplitude has this product structure in the poles of STU downstairs. And the same thing is true in Yang Mills where you'd have a product structure, one over ST in the actual amplitude downstairs. And that's quite a deep fact. 
Um, uh, you might say, well, what's going on? Because I know from Feynman diagrams that I would get something the S channel plus T channel plus U channel, and that's true. But each coefficient, each numerator would have a bunch of polarization vectors and would not be gauge invariant. They're not individually gauge invariant. Only when you, uh, or individually Lorentz invariant, if you do the calculation in some gauge, you fix the gauge like light cone gauge. Um, so there's no way to represent the answer, the sum over channels, that's either gauge invariant or Lorentz invariant, the actual full amplitude does not want to be separated into channels, okay? Um, and, it's, and that's again different from just the dumb theory of scalars, which would just be separated into channels. It's exactly these theories where the final amplitude does not want to be separated into channels are the ones that from conventional Lagrangian descriptions, we need gauge redundancy or diff redundancy in order to talk about. But this is already something again, that has a stringy smell to it. You don't want to think about the things as a sum over channels. They're sort of one block, um, which is what the amplitude actually looks like. In any case, so let's say we we uh, we uh, begin with this amplitude, and now we want to fix it in some way. We want to multiply. We want to multiply it by some factors in such a way that it's softer at the uh, high energy. We've already learned from our previous argument that there's no way we're going to do that with a finite number of uh, poles. So I'm just going to write down whatever the formula is. I'm going to imagine putting all the poles downstairs together. So just a big product of S, T, and U. Okay, I just have a giant product like that. And there's some numerator. Okay. Now, this numerator has a huge job to do because um, uh, uh, you see, if I sit on a pole at S equals M squared, um, we have to, again, be able to interpret uh, the residue as the exchange of some finite number of particles. In particular, uh, uh, it should be a, just a polynomial in T. But in the way I've written it, it can't be, it doesn't look like a polynomial in T because there's just one over T minus M squared downstairs. And so that's a minimal job that this numerator should do is it should have zeros to kill this uh, one over T minus M squared, uh, one over uh, U minus M squared uh, residue when you sit at S goes to some MJ squared. All right, so this numerator has got to have a whole stack of zeros. Well, the most minimal ansatz you could make is that the only zeros of the numerator, in fact, all the numerator should do, nothing else, is just put zeros in order to kill all of those uh, 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 unwanted guys. That doesn't mean that it's unique, but it's certainly the first thing that you would do. And then with just sort of two lines of algebra, you land on the Verisor or Shapiro amplitude. Okay? Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, simple argument. Uh, if you write a, a, a numerator again uh, in this form, it has to have this sort of a, a, a SDU symmetry. And simply uh, by the fact that when you put uh, S equals M squared, you have to kill these guys downstairs. Uh, we learned that these, this set of all roots should contain both MI squared as well as MI squared plus MJ squared in it. And that in turn, essentially uniquely, not quite, but essentially uniquely fixes the M squareds to be a linear spectrum, which in turn, putting back into this formula, gives me the verisor shapiro amplitude. So this is by no means a derivation of the verisor shapiro amplitude, but it does show that once you start thinking in this way, it's definitely the first thing that you would write down, okay? So, but now we can go to the question that I mentioned uh, at, the very, at, the, at the very start. Let's look at this beautiful Verisor Shapiro amplitude. Is there some sense in which this is the unique UV completion of, uh, of uh, gravity? Um, uh, in other words, is this the uh, uh, unique uh, expression with only poles, tree level, um, uh, which matches gravity at low energies? What are the rules? The rules is at the, that uh, it has to be soft at high energies. Causality is reflected in Reggie behavior. Causality tells you that when you hold T fixed and you go to large S, the amplitude should, uh, should scale no more quickly than S squared. So that's one constraint. But that's also relatively easy to satisfy. If you're trying to come up with uh, invent functions, the Reggie behavior is kind of trivial to a satisfy. The real miracle is that when you sit on a massive pole, uh, uh, you have to have unitarity. 
and we'll go through this kind of, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do these um, uh, computations in more detail uh, in a second, but just to get a, get a flavor for what's going on. Um, if, I, if I sit on a pole, I get some residue in T that looks like a polynomial, like one plus T, two plus T, three plus T, and, and, and so on. But again, we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail in a second. Um, so- Nima, I have a question. Yeah. So where does uh, having a finite number of particles mess up with these amplitudes? What, what breaks down? Yeah, so, so that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good question. That's kind of a, it's a, it's a first assumption to uh, uh, begin with. Um, uh, what the kind of normal thing you'd say is if you have an infinite number of particles and they have a finite coupling, you see the, the, the residues are not getting small. I, I'd say like at level two, it has some finite coupling and there's infinitely many of them. Um, uh, that looks like it would be disastrous for, I mean, for any kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of consistent uh, unitarity with these guys. Um, I mean, it, it, and also it seems like, um, I'm just telling you typical arguments people make. If, if you have infinitely many particles at a fixed mass uh, and they're interacting, um, you like heat up the system to epsilon temperature, and you're going to have like uh, you're going to have uh, 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 catastrophic problems with the free energy and so on. Um, so, so an infinite number of particles at a fixed uh, at a fixed mass with fixed coupling um, uh, sounds uh, sounds bad. Um, and um, uh, now um, uh, something which is uh, also assumed here, um, I, I it was tacit. I didn't I didn't spell it all explicitly. Is that we don't have uh, accumulation points, so that we also don't have like you know the sort of poles keep on going on forever and they don't get closer and closer to each other. In fact, it's known if you do allow accumulation points for the poles to get closer and closer to each other, there is a sort of uh, infamous amplitude, the Kuhn's amplitude, which is a kind of a Q deformation of the string amplitudes, which also rather with the same miracle satisfies uh, the same kind of miracle satisfies unitarity. And there's nothing so obviously wrong with that. I mean, an accumulation point is like the hydrogen atom, you know? So it could be that it's something like a bound state and then past a certain point you ionize, or maybe it's kind of a string that breaks or something like that. Um, so uh, so that's, that's, I think, a more plausible, uh, uh, more reasonable direction. Um, but uh, here, in really the sort of simplest thing, we're, we're assuming that there's no accumulation points and there's no uh, infinite power at a fixed uh, mass. Nathan. We have another question from Nathan. Uh, yes. Um, suppose you know the spectrum yeah. of the string. Is that enough to, to determine the four-point amplitude? Uh, no. I'm going to come. I, I'm going to exactly show you the, some little counterexamples in, in a moment. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So yeah, but uh, again, we'll, we'll we'll go through this in in, in detail in a second, but just 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 to give you a flavor. Um, so, so the, the residue at the, uh, at the nth level looks something like one plus t, two plus t, et cetera. And then I have to convert that to a function of the scattering angle cosine theta. So I use the usual conversion between t and cosine theta. And this is the, this is the polynomial that you get, okay? So I really love this because this is really something you could give a kid, a smart kid in, you know, in high school. Um, you give them this, this is the polynomial, okay? And now the claim is that this polynomial has an expansion as a sum over Legend polynomials with positive coefficients. That's unitarity. Okay, if this kid in high school might not even know about Legend polynomials, but you can just say just expand it in cos theta itself. Um, uh, uh, in, 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 in the Fourier series, cos theta, cos two theta, and so on. Um, that's an, and it turns out to be an amazingly non-trivial statement. Okay, so already at the n equals uh, three level, um, the polynomial that we get here is cos squared theta minus one over nine. And you see what the problem is, because uh, cos squared theta looks like spin two, but the Legendre polynomial in d dimensions, because of taking out the traces, is cos squared theta minus one over d minus one. Um, so this is cos squared theta minus one over spatial d plus one over spatial d minus one over nine. And so you see that if, if d is bigger than a nine spatial dimensions, there's necessarily a ghost. The spin zero part of the spin zero part is negative. Okay, so it's not trivial that this is consistent with the unitary. In fact, we'll see in the real superstring, um, uh, in the in the in the in the real superstring, there's already something interesting even at n equals one that comes from the polarization part. So we'll we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But but uh, I, I'm already just here pointing out that the residues, like a, these very simple polynomials in cosine theta, 
By the way, these polynomials just have evenly spaced roots. That's all they are. They have evenly spaced roots uh, between minus one and one. They don't have a root at one or at minus one, but after that, they go in by one over n and they're evenly spaced after that. Okay? So the sort of miracle is that these very simple polynomials have positive expansions in, uh, in, Gegerbauer, in Gegenbauer polynomials. All right, now that's such a miraculous fact that you might think, gosh, okay, then uh, maybe that's enough. Uh, um, to, uh, 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 yeah, maybe it's almost impossible to write down anything else, but it turns out the answer is no. Okay. And here's a very simple uh, kind of counterexample. Of course, there's big classes of generalizations away from it. It's not something that goes far away from strings, but, um, but using the, the same ingredients. Um, but, uh, but here's the counterexample. So, so here's the, uh, the gravity amplitude, and I'm just gonna add a little correction here. That's epsilon times uh, gamma, where I just shift, I add one to everything. So gamma one minus S, one minus C, one minus U over two plus S, two plus C, two plus U and so on. Okay, um, uh, as to Nathan's point, this has still exactly the stringy spectrum, still the linear spectrum, but you can show that so long as this coefficient is not too big, um, it's still positive. It still has a positive expansion. And uh, the way we can prove that, uh, I just told you that it's extremely non-trivial to directly prove that this thing is positive. And that's what we'll be talking about in, the, in, in much of the rest of the talk. But assuming that this polynomial is positive, um, then there are very simple operations. Like you, if you take a positive polynomial and you multiply it by another one that's positive, uh, that has a positive expansion, then it's sort of trivial that the product also has a positive expansion. Okay. Um, so using simple facts like that, uh, if you know that this one is positive, then you can show that this one is also positive so long as epsilon is not too big. And if epsilon gets does hit one, then it's not positive, okay? But there's a range of deformations for which uh, uh, this positivity remains. And this is an example, again, it's a, one of a family of examples like this. It, it has the same Reggie behavior, the same exponential softness, unitary. There's nothing obviously wrong with it. Um, uh, so, uh, so it's just not true that massless scattering uh, consistency is enough to nail the gravity amplitude. I should say that it's amusing that we still don't have an example of something like this for open string amplitudes. It's really only the closed string amplitudes that we have uh, these uh, deformations for. Still, after lots of work, we did not manage to find any interesting deformation of the open string amplitude. That's relevant because as, as, as you'll see in a moment, all of this positivity, of course, follows from a basic fact about the open strings. And in a sense, the closed string positivity is looser because the closed string residues will be kind of the square of the open string residues. And so, uh, so somehow the closed string consistency is not as strong as the open string one. So the fact that we still haven't found a deformation for the open string one is, is maybe amusing. But in any case, you know, as a flat out answer to the question, is string theory the unique UV completion of gravity amplitudes that satisfies all the rules for massless amplitudes? No, okay, here are some uh, counter examples. Now, um, if, this is not, yeah. If you go to higher point, are yeah, they, are that's they... right. Yeah. So, so it could be, yeah. So, sorry, four point, only, only four point. Yeah. So, it could be you want to find some deformation that also uh, consistently factorizes at higher points. That, of course, is now very closely related to consistent factorization on massive poles for four points. Okay. And so, that's, I think, the sort of basic point is that uh, uh, we clearly have to also consider the consistency of the massive scattering, too. And this is totally reasonable. Um, uh, I mean, it's exactly the story of the weak interactions. We started with the four Fermi interaction. We integrated the W to sort of soften that at high energies, but we're not done because then we have to look at the scattering of the W's and the longitudinal component of W's grow at high energies and that needed the Higgs. And only finally at that last stage did we have something that uh, fully made sense. So it's definitely not unreasonable that we have to look at the consistency for the massive uh, amplitudes. But it, it now seems like a more technically difficult problem to do that. I should say uh, it's really sort of attacking this problem is what uh, motivated uh, Uten and I and our friends to sort of develop this formalism for talking about massive amplitudes for any mass and spin, uh, um, at least in four dimensions using this very, very simple version of the uh, uh, spinner helicity formalism, which I still hope will be useful for coming back and thinking about this, this problem. Okay, so that was the that was a sort of a general uh, context, uh, and now let me get to talking about um, uh, the, the 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 beef of the matter here, which is the unitarity of the uh, string uh, four point trees. But let me pause again to ask if there are any uh, any any questions. 
Okay. So let's talk about um, uh, four point three amplitudes and let's begin with the op open bosonic string tachyons. <clears throat> so just the, the Veneziano amplitude. So here the residue uh, at the nth level is just, uh, um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm not gonna be careful about keeping overall prefactors. Uh, I'm only interested in the dependence on, on, on the scattering angle in, in the end. So I, I apologize if, if I lose some of these factors uh, uh, as we go. Anyway, the residue at S equals N is two plus T, three plus T dot, dot, dot. <clears throat> now to do the partial wave expansion for this guy, I want to write T in terms of cosine theta for general masses. This is the usual formula. T is S half minus two M squared times cos theta minus one. And if I put M squared equals minus one, and I sit at the, uh, at, and I'm putting S equals N, this is just N plus four times X minus one over two. So uh, X from now on is going to be uh, cosine theta. So the residue on the first massive pole is one. On the second massive pole is uh, X. Um, uh, sorry, at n equal, at, uh, sorry, at s equals minus one is one, s equals zero is x. And at the first positive massive level, it's this nice polynomial x minus a fifth times x plus a fifth. At the second level, it's x minus two six, x, x plus two six, and so on. So you, you, you see the pattern. You go between minus n minus four over n and n uh, minus four over n with evenly spaced roots. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's this uh, uh, formula down there. But let's start with the very first one, the very first interesting massive level. Uh, our polynomial is x minus a fifth times x plus a fifth, which is x squared minus one over 25. And again, it's exactly the same as what we saw before. The Gegenbauer in d dimensions for spin two is x squared minus one over d minus one. And so that guy is there with positive coefficient. Um, but the spin zero that's left uh, uh, vanishes in d equals 26 is positive for d bigger than 26 and would give us a ghost for d less than 26. Okay, so that's a sort of beautiful way in which just this, uh, just the beta function, just the Venetian amplitude sort of secretly knows about uh, uh, d equals 26 uh, already. All right, so um, before going on to the superstring, I just want to quickly uh, uh, do, again, this is, this is sort of the standard uh, uh, undergraduate stuff, but um, uh, but I, I want to talk about the, uh, just the, the sort of cleanest way of thinking about what the partial wave expansion is, because in a moment when we go to the uh, to the superstring, we're going to be doing a spinning version of this. Um, and of course, all of this is quote unquote just group theory. Okay, so but I just want to be explicit about how we do this quote unquote just group theory. Okay, so let's already talk about the um, uh, the scalar case. So, so all we have in scalars is we have uh, is we have the incoming states with equal and opposite momentum and the outgoing states with equal and opposite momentum in the center of mass frame. Even the energy is is being scaled out. So all my states is is essentially one state for the in state, which you can represent by just a single unit vector on the on the sphere, and the out state is another single unit vector on the sphere. Of course, that single unit vector is telling me about the two incoming states with equal and opposite momentum, and the other single unit vector is telling me about the two outgoing states with equal and opposite momentum. But it's natural to define the Hilbert space that just lives on the unit sphere, uh, whose states are just labeled by that. I mean, just that the, the, the states are just uh, uh, just uh, delta functions localized uh, at a given point on, on the unit sphere. Okay, so, so, so we have a Hilbert space. And now if you give me any function, that, uh, that depends on two unit vectors, any function of X and Y, of course, defines an operator in the Hilbert space so backwards and forwards, an operator defines a function via this uh, standard thing. Okay, so the matrix solvent of this operator will, will be the function. Now, if this function is only a function of the dot products of X and Y, it's rotationally invariant. And so that tells us that the operator is rotationally invariant. So we'd like to figure out how do we talk about um, uh, rotationally invariant operators. How do we build rotationally invariant operators in this Hilbert space? And then matrix elements of those rotationally invariant operators will tell us something about rotationally invariant functions of, uh, of this uh, x dot y, the, the cosine of the angle between the in and outgoing vectors. Well, to begin with, we start with our states. And these are perfectly beautiful states under rotations. They just transform w goes to rw. But there's a continuous infinitely many of these states. And so this is a highly, highly reducible representation of rotations. As usual, it's useful to build irreducible representations. So how do we build irreducible representations? We we'll have to take linear combinations of these guys 
that transformed as finite dimensional representations of SO B minus one, okay? So for instance, I can build a spin zero representation just by, by averaging uh, these uh, states W over the whole sphere. So this integral is over the, the unit sphere. Um, I can have states that have a single SO index by averaging multiplying by, by uh, WI. I can have something with two indices where I integrate and I have WI1, WI2, but that guy would not be an irrep um, because it wouldn't be traceless. So we know that, that the irreps of SOD minus one here should be traceless. So that's why I have to subtract out of this one over uh, uh, the spatial D times delta I1, I2. And now this state is, uh, is traceless and it transforms as the uh, traceless symmetric tensor for SOD minus one, spin two, et cetera. Okay, so, so this is just the totally obvious thing, spherical harmonics, uh, all the stuff we uh, uh, normally talk about. Um, now, since these states are just uh, symmetric tensors, it's natural to package them just uh, in the following way, just so I don't, uh, uh, I don't uh, uh, keep track of all these indices. I'm just gonna define a, a state uh, with a label Z um, and uh, still uh, spin S, sorry. Um, uh, my laptop is causing me problems. Just by, just by uh, contracting all of these I1 through IS states with ZI1 through ZIS. Okay, I can reconstruct the state I1 through IS just by taking S derivatives of this state ZS. Um, uh, so, uh, and this state, of course, has a nice overlap with the original basis of the Hilbert space, and that defines the Gegenbauer polynomials. Okay, so the Gegenbauer polynomials are literally just defined by the overlap of these irrep states with uh, the, the states that we started with. And of course, they're, they're going to have standard orthogonality properties. So, so the overlap of two of these nice irrep states uh, is zero unless the spins are the same. And if the spins are, uh, and, and, and the dependence on this Z and Z prime is exactly the uh, uh, Gegenbauer polynomial. Okay, so now we have a nice set of states. Now let's talk about any operator on the silver space. A random operator on the silver space is, well, just, I, I just take uh, some bras and cats and I contract them with some big tensor. But if this operator is rotationally invariant, then this big tensor can only have deltas, can only be built out of deltas and furthermore, the deltas can only contract the i's with the j's because each piece uh, uh, is traceless. Okay, all these i1 through is are, are, are irrep, so they're, so they're traceless. And so that means that any rotationally invariant operator can be in the end written as a sum with some coefficients of these nice states, zs, zs, uh, integrated over the uh, uh, unit sphere. Okay, so that's how we represent any rotationally invariant operator on this uh, Hilbert space. And therefore, its matrix element. I can just take its. Uh, uh, I can take its matrix element and use the orthogonality of these. Uh, this is really the sort of completeness of, of uh, the completeness relation to to show that any operator sandwiched between x and y can be expanded as a sum over uh, Gegenbauer's of x dot y if the operator is rotational. Yeah. Okay. And again, conversely, given any function of x dot y. Uh, which I can expand as a sum with some coefficient c, uh, c of the Gegenbauer's of x dot y, I can build a rotationally invariant operator on this Hilbert space that will give me this function as its matrix cell. Okay, so okay. all very, very uh, uh, straightforward, but it will be useful in a moment uh, that now that we proceed to talking about um, uh, the uh, superstring. All right, so let's proceed to the superstring, but actually before we get to the superstring, I just want to remind you what the gluon amplitudes look like, just the tree level gluon uh, uh, amplitudes look like before we uh, stringy complete them. And there's this famous uh, fact that the that at least at four points, the, the Yang-Mills amplitude has this kind of striking structure. It looks like, uh, sorry, this is the color ordered amplitude. Okay, so it looks like one over ST, but the numerator, so the, the denominator is uh, of course cyclically invariant as it should be uh, because it's color ordered. But the numerator is actually permutation invariant. And it's this famous f to the fourth uh, polynomial. Um, it's f mu nu f mu nu squared minus four uh, f to the fourth, where what I really mean by this is that uh, in this expression, I put f mu nu as a sum of some little f mu nu's where those little f mu nu's are built out of polarization vectors. So p mu epsilon nu minus p nu uh, epsilon mu. And when I when I uh, and in this uh, when I expand this, I only keep the pieces that are linear in each uh, polarization vector in order to extract the amplitude. Okay, 
So <clears throat> that's the that's the uh, Yagnosa amplitude, and there's this kind of cool tensor. There's this cool f to the fourth tensor that sits in its numerator. That's going to be uh, the star of the next uh, couple of slides. OK, so now let's go to the type 1 uh, superstring amplitude, which is just that same f to the fourth out front multiplied by gamma, gamma over gamma. Uh, and let's already fit up the first massive residue at s equals 1. At s equals 1, the part coming from gamma, gamma over gamma is just 1. Uh, at general, sorry, let me just say for a sec where we're going to get in general s. At general s, we're going to get this f to the fourth, which has some polarization dependence multiplied by some polynomial of x, as we talked about before, OK? Um, but uh, even at s equals 1, that polynomial is just 1. All I have is f to the fourth. And as we'll see now, already this f to the fourth knows about d equals 10. Okay? So already there's something at the first level about the physical consistency. But to do that, we have to talk about what the sort of spinning version of this uh, Gegenbauer uh, expansion. So now we're going to do the partial wave expansion just of f to the fourth, which is uh, also, again, the, it's, it's a partial wave expansion of the numerator of the Yang Mills amplitude, which is also the, the, the partial wave expansion of the, of the first massive residue in the string amplitude. OK, <clears throat> so just to be uh, con concrete here, I'm just uh, pulling some, some, some things out of the, the paper. So here's f to the fourth. Um, but if we, if we uh, here, here's our kinematic picture. If we go to the center of mass frame and we use a gauge where the polarization vectors are all, uh, are all in the spatial component, um, then, uh, in, then, uh, then you can explicitly write out what this f to the fourth is in terms of various contractions of the polarization vectors as well as uh, cosine theta, which is uh, x dot y. Uh, the, my x and y here are the unit vectors for the in and outgoing space. Okay, so this is some, some specific concrete uh, um, uh, function of polarization vectors and the, and, the, uh, and, uh, and the unit vectors on the sphere. And once again, what we'd like to show is that this thing uh, can be, uh, that, that what we'd like to show is that this thing can be uh, represented as a positive operator on this, uh, uh, on this Hilbert space that now has some extra degrees of freedom associated with the spins of the particles. OK, and uh, just repeating what I said a second ago, the, the, uh, the residue at the nth massive level is just the same function all the time, the f to the fourth, now multiplied by an extra function of just x dot y, extra function of, uh, of uh, cosine theta. Okay? But what we're going to do is, first of all, see that, um, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore, this defines some operator on uh, on this Hilbert space. What is the Hilbert space? Um, uh, the states are labeled again. The pair of states now. Uh, again, remember before we had uh, we we labeled the state by by point on the unit sphere, but that that labeled the pair of in uh, of, of of incoming particles of e equal and opposite momenta. So now the states are going to be labeled by a unit vector as well as a pair of indices, one uh, for for each polarization vector. Of the of the two incoming states, and then we'll also have similarly for the outgoing states. Okay, so so our Hilbert space is now going to be labeled by x and two other indices a b for the uh, 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 for the two other spatial indices, and so what we want to what we want to what we're looking for is an operator. Well, uh, this this residue defines an operator on this Hilbert space R n whose matrix element is f to the fourth multiplied by the scalar function that we get from the, uh, from the residue, that polynomial um, uh, in, in cosine theta that we talked about before. So what we'd li like to do is show that this operator Rn is positive. Okay? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a positive value. So, OK, so the partial wave expansion, again, this is the all the trivial just group theory, but just to be explicit about it. So saying, again, our Hilbert space is labeled by states with a unit vector w as well as two other indices ij for the uh, uh, keeping track of the polarizations. And again, we want to build irrap. So I can build a spin zero irrap just by integrating over w, but I have to also contract the two indices. I can build now two kinds of spin two um, uh, irraps uh, by, by uh, contracting the, the indices of the w with these ij's in the Hilbert space in different ways. I can build an anti-symmetric, uh, a three-rank anti-symmetric tensor, and so on. Okay, so in general, for any young tableau, 
we can build, uh, we can build uh, for any uh, young tableau representing irreps of, uh, of, uh, uh, of SOD minus one, I can build uh, the, the, uh, uh, the irreps in, in this way. Um, and, uh, but uh, these are the only ones that I'm gonna uh, uh, explicitly need in, uh, that I'm gonna explicitly need now. So, um, so now, uh, and you, you can sort of easily see these are the only ones that can possibly contribute with this kind of uh, uh, F to the fourth structure. So now you, you write a most general ansatz you can for a rotationally invariant operator just involving these states. So you'd have the spin zero, you'd have some two by two matrix involving these two kinds of spin two, you would have the anti-symmetric uh, spin three guy. And then we just sandwiched it between, uh, we just uh, uh, sandwiched it between two general states Here's what you get. And then you just match the coefficients to the coefficients that we see here in F to the fourth. And that allows you to determine all the coefficients and to your lovely surprise, a nine over D minus one makes an appearance here for some scalar coefficient, okay? So in the end of the day, uh, this is what the operator is. The F to the fourth operator is the matrix element of the following operator, the F to the fourth Term is the matrix element of the following operator on this uh, on this Hilbert space of a spin zero, spin two. These and in fact, um, uh, only one uh, linear combination of the uh, spin two guys makes an appearance. So that sort of two by two matrix in the spin two space really just has rank one. So literally just one linear combination of them appear, and this interesting anti-symmetric spin three guy. And so we discover that uh, that this doesn't have a positive partial wave expansion if D is bigger than 10. And in D equals 10, it's fine, but the spin zero state is missing. And then of course, everything is fine for uh, D less than 10, okay? And the, the states that we see for D equals 10 are exactly the states that we expect to see from the world sheet description of uh, the type one string. So the massive spin two and the anti-symmetric massive spin three state. But it's amusing that in some sense, already tree-level Yang Mills that gives us this wonderful numerator already knows about D equals 10 in the sense that if you had the crazy idea to do the partial wave expansion for the numerator of Yang Mills, you would discover something of the Yang Mills tree amplitude, you would discover something interesting happens in uh, D equals 10. Okay? <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> now it's actually easy to extend uh, this to, uh, to uh, uh, to unitarity at all level, assuming that this function, uh, that this polynomial that we saw before, this polynomial of cosine theta, uh, that just comes from the gamma gamma over gamma part, if you assume that that has a positive expansion in terms of Gegenbauer polynomials, then uh, then it's easy to see that this uh, that the general operator at a general level is also manifestly positive, and essentially uh, at a general level, all you get is exactly the same sum as we had before, but roughly speaking, you tensor all these states that we saw, um, all these states that we saw at the, at, the, at the first massive level with all the states that you see on the massive poles in the, uh, sorry, uh, all, all the spin states that you see just in the Gegenbauer expansion of the polynomial part, okay? And uh, so the, technically this is a really trivial statement that given any state in, in, uh, in the Silbert space, you can define another state that kind of uh, 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 has some extra labels to do with the possible other spins just in the following way. Um, I'm gonna uh, define the matrix element of the new state in this Hilbert space as being uh, um, uh, the matrix element of the old state simply multiplied by the jth Gegenbauer polynomial. Um, and, uh, and, and if you do that, then it's, then it's trivial to see that if this uh, residue function of x dot y is a positive expansion, then uh, I just define this operator with those coefficients, those coefficients b coming from the expansion of this, um, I, just, uh, I just define uh, the operator on the nth level um, to just be the sum over all those, uh, to, to, to be what I saw already uh, um, at, the, at the first massive level, just sort of uh, with, with these extra J indices attached. I, I wanna stress something here because what we have not done is a partial wave expansion uh, of, in the conventional sense of the nth uh, residue. In other words, I've given you an expansion for this operator in terms of polynomial, uh, in terms of states that are not orthogonal to each other. These, these states that I define are not orthogonal to each other 
but it doesn't matter. I don't care. I, I've, I've defined an operator, a manifestly positive operator, whose matrix elements <coughs> are exactly what I want. Um, if you really wanted to do uh, a flat out honest partial wave expansion with really, really orthogonal states, you would have to do more work to, uh, to do that, but it's entirely unnecessary. Um, and in fact, what really naturally comes out of the fact that we have the f to the fourth structure multiplied by some simple scalar function of cosine theta, what's really naturally handed to us is a sort of product that we don't then further expand as the irreps. Uh, we just sort of, uh, we, it's just clear that, 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 that we get a, a positive operator. Okay, <clears throat> so really everything boils down to uh, showing um, that uh, everything boils down to showing that this simple polynomial uh, of X uh, for type one um, uh, has a positive expansion in terms of uh, uh, Gegenbauer's. And note already that this polynomial when N equals one was just one. So that trivially has a positive expansion. So already here, we, we saw from the F to the fourth story that we already get D less than or equal to 10. But then also at higher, uh, for the higher levels, it has to be positive. So if I go to the next level, it's just X. Well, already at the third level, this is the thing that I flagged uh, earlier on, uh, but um, uh, uh, we get this uh, X squared minus a ninth, um, which uh, again is only uh, consistent, is only positive when D is less than or equal to a 10. Okay. Um, but if you now, so, so, so now after all of this uh, 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 trivial group theory song and dance is done, all we have to do is prove that this very simple polynomial in X can be expanded in Gegenbauer's with positive coefficients, um, so long as D is less than or equal to 10. So we, we know that when D is bigger than 10, it isn't. But when D is less than or equal to 10, we want to show for all levels, for all N, that it does have a positive expansion. And you can just start doing it. I mean, you can just do it in Mathematica, put it on the computer, and this is, this is what you get. Okay? So this is what you get for a spin 0, 1, 2, 3, depending on level. Um, and uh, so you get all these functions that depend on, on, uh, on dimension. And the claim is every single one of these functions, but you see, you don't get, you, everything has plus and minus signs in it. And, uh, and the claim is that every one of these coefficients is positive so long as D is uh, 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 less than or equal to 10. I wanna make a, a comment here. You'll notice that the, the coefficients are alternating uh, in, in spin. And that's because this polynomial, this residue polynomial is either even or odd depending on level. Okay, so when it's even, only the even spins uh, contribute. When it's odd, only the odd spins uh, contribute. And this is a, a, a simple uh, reflection of a, a world sheet parity symmetry uh, here. <clears throat> okay, uh, so much for the uh, open, uh, uh, Super strings. Let's just talk about the, the type two super strings. The heterotic story is, uh, as you would expect, just the sort of product uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, any, that, uh, I won't say anything about the heterotic, but it goes through in exactly the same way. Um, oh, sorry. Did my screen just stop sharing? Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, so here's, the, here's the type two. Uh, uh, formula. Now we have this famous R to the fourth multiplied by uh, Verso or Shapiro. If you look at the residue at S equals N, it's this uh, R to the fourth. Um, and uh, the, the part that comes from gamma, gamma, gamma is just this, the polynomial is literally the square of the polynomial for type one. And therefore, this part manifestly has a positive expansion in Gegenbauer's because uh, the spin one does. Again, it's a tri trivial fact that the product of two Gegenbauer's of spin one and two has a positive expansion in the sum of Gegenbauer's simply because the, the representations, have, uh, the product of the two representations decompose into the sum of other representations with positive coefficients, okay? Um, so this is a positive Gegenbauer expansion. And as you'd expect, this R to the fourth operator now should be defined on a Hilbert space where, the, where we have a, 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 a W and four indices on it, but in, in the obvious way, uh, the operator that's defined on this bigger Hilbert space is a sort of square of the operator that we saw uh, defined on the for the uh, spin one case. So this guy's positive because it's the square of the f to the fourth part. This guy's positive because the polynomial is the square of the Gegenbauer part. And so therefore the, the unitarity of the closed string follows 
again, trivially from that of the open string. And the same thing is true for the heterotic string. So really everything boils down to proving this fact that the, that the, the uh, type one string has this uh, positive extension. Okay, any questions about that? All right. So, so uh, from uh, here on in, we're, we just have a we just have a little math problem. I mean, I have this uh, I have this polynomial. I want to extract. Uh, uh, I want to I want to uh, expand it in these orthogonal polynomials. So, the most trivial thing to do just uh, use the orthogonality of, uh, to just write the uh, coefficient as just the integral of Gegenbauer's with the with the their orthogonal measure and uh, multiplied by the polynomial. And so I have to show that this integral is positive. And there are some actually easy limits. Um, one trivial limit is when uh, the spin is exactly equal to J or the very top, the very highest spin. Okay, That's of course trivially positive because the polynomial begins as positive X to the N. Okay? And therefore the coefficient of the highest Gegenbauer is trivially positive. Um, of course, what happens, you then have to subtract that guy off, you want to see whether the, 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 the leftover one is positive as well. Um, and so that's actually easy to do in steps. The, 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 the highest one is uh, trivially positive, and you can go one step down and do a little bit more work, and two steps down and do more and more work to show that it's positive. It's not manifestly positive, though, because any direct expansion of this integral will give you plus and minus sign. All right? But one obvious limit is when the spin is close to n. Another obvious limit is when the spin is close to zero. In fact, let's do spin zero literally. To get do spin zero, I'm integrating this residue against uh, just one, okay, just just the constant. But now let's think about what this residue, uh, what this R n of x looks like. Remember, this R n of x is something that looks like uh, 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 it's a polynomial in x with the uh, evenly spaced roots between minus one and one not at minus one literally or one, but one over n in from there and evenly spaced. So what that means is that near x equals one and minus one, it's something of order one. But the moment you start getting inside, it's a product of an enormous number of terms that are smaller than one. And so the so this polynomial gets really tiny uh, uh, as soon as you get within sort of one over n away. Uh, if you're up at spin j, as soon as you get so uh, within sort of one over j away um, uh, from, uh, sorry, if you're at level n, as soon as you get roughly one over n away from the from the endpoints, uh, it gets uh, exponentially small. And therefore, when you integrate against uh, just a constant, um, even though you see the, the reason it's not obvious is that the, they're they're wiggles. There's plus and minus signs here, um, but this part with plus and minus signs is just clearly subdominant. To, uh, to the part which is sort of healthfully positive coming from the wings. Okay, so, so it's very easy to see when the spin is uh, small, when it's, the spin is zero, and then again, there's a little more work, uh, but more and more work as you make the spin bigger um, of bounding how big the negative contributions can be relative to the positive ones near the wings. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so, so you can show positivity at the two ends. Um, now, it's ironic because if you actually numerically plot what this looks like, you get something which starts uh, at, uh, at spin zero at some value. It actually grows up to a uh, spin of roughly root n at the nth level. And then it starts dying away from there and actually dies exponentially as you go uh, up to the top near n. Uh, near near spin of uh, near near when the spin is of order n, so it's sort of ironic that it's very easy to prove positivity in the wings here, where the actual answer, uh, sorry, the ends where the where the answer is small. The actual answer is getting bigger in the middle, but it's ironically just very it's devilishly hard to directly prove positivity um, here in the uh, middle. Okay, and again, the reason is any direct expansion, it just gives you expressions with plus and minus signs, and it's not obvious why they add up to something positive. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so, uh, uh, so that's what uh, motivated trying to find some way, some representations uh, of, this, uh, of this residue, uh, which would uh, allow us to see positivity more easily. But anyway, in the, in the act of uh, doing this, 
uh, we found this, uh, I think, very interesting uh, representation of, uh, of the residue. And I think uh, independent of its uh, uh, use in um, uh, proving positivity, which, as I said, we'll be able to do when D is less than or equal to six, I find this a kind of a striking representation. I would love to have a more conceptual understanding of where this representation comes from. Um, just just, just to, to say again why it's, uh, to me, a little surprising that there should be a nice formula like this, because you know the amplitude itself is clearly a completely canonical thing. Um, but it's not at all obvious ahead of time that there should be anything canonical about doing the partial wave expansion of the residue of the amplitude. And in fact, as you start doing it, nothing nice seems nothing nice seems to be happening. You just get some complicated integral of the of the Gegenbauer against these funny residues. Um, uh, and um, uh, I wasn't sure exactly what to do. Um, uh, uh, you know, at a blackboard, it would be easier to sort of really step by step go through the details of the derivation. But on the other hand, I don't just want to let's just barf out this uh, formula. So what I'm going to do just in the next few um, in the next uh, 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 in the next few pages is actually just it, it just go through the, uh, the the argument that we gave in the paper and just highlight what some of the uh, uh, important steps are. Um, but uh, uh, but there is. In, in, in the middle of this derivation, something sort of peculiarly nice happens. Um, and, uh, uh, and I want to highlight what that is. Maybe it's a clue to, um, to, a, to a more conceptual understanding of where this comes from. Okay? But actually, before getting there, uh, so let's just look at this uh, formula for a second. It's written as this uh, interesting double contour integral. And what this double contour integral means is really that this is instructing you to do a Laurent expansion of this guy, of this v minus u to the j. But this double contour integral means that you first do an expansion in v, and then you do an expansion in u and pick out the uh, the uh, coefficient. So, so it's a double contour integral. Um, uh, the integral around v is like extracting the coefficients of one or v in the expansion with fixed u. And after you do that, you're picking out the coefficient of uh, one over u. OK? so. Um, so it's not symmetrical. It's not symmetrical between u and v. There's an order in here. First, I do the contour integral around v, uh, and then the contour integral around u. But the expression has a symmetry between uh, uh, v and u. So again, it's an iterated residue. <clears throat> and um, yeah, OK. So uh, what I want to do before I tell you where this formula comes from is just indicate how it gives you uh, uh, this easy proof of positivity of the residues when d is less than or equal to 6. And also that you can easily use it to get some asymptotics for what these uh, for what these uh, residues look like. So first, um, let's see how we get uh, the proof of uh, positivity. <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, uh, just uh, uh, switch variables from you see there's this e to the v and e to the u, and I'm going to uh, that motivates uh, uh, switching to uh, to u as a log one minus x v is log log one minus y. So this is just exactly the same expression, just, just uh, slightly changing variables. Um, but uh, again, all I'm doing here is doing a double Laurent expansion. First in, in y at fixed, uh, at fixed x, and then in x. And so the positivity of this expression is going to follow from two facts. First, if I look at this kind of, uh, this guy, uh, and here nothing depends on d. Here nothing depends on yeah. Here nothing depends on the number of spatial dimensions. This little kernel um, has a manifestly positive Laurent expansion in x and y in, in 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 y and then x. Okay, so that's one important fact. And a second important fact is that this little guy, which now does depend on the number of space space time dimension, has a manifest positive Laurent expansion when uh, d is less than or equal to six. So that's why uh, we, we can prove things easily when d is less than or equal to six, because this little expression is manifestly uh, as a manifest positive Laurent expansion with d is, d is less than or equal to six. And combining these two facts trivially shows that uh, that this whole expression, which is just picking out one term in that big Laurent expansion, is giving us uh, uh, something positive. So um, what all of this follows from are, are essentially the following simple facts about these these functions. So if you look at this function, one over log one minus z plus one over z, and you expand this out, this has all positive coefficients. And you see, this is already not totally obvious because one over log one minus z has, I mean, is, is z plus z squared over two dot, dot, dot here. 
But uh, this is not, you know, when I invert it, I can have plus and minus signs. But the claim is that this whole thing always has positive coefficients. And then there are little cousins of that fact, closely related cousins of that fact. This function has all positive coefficients. This, and finally, darn it, sorry guys. Finally, this function, which uh, we saw uh, uh, in, in, in the second term that has some dimension dependence, um, this function for any old alpha um, does not have a manifest positive expansion, but does when alpha is less than or equal to two. And the alpha here less than or equal to two is what translates to d less than or equal to six in, in its use for the previous expression. Okay, so the so first we have to understand why these little simple functions have manifest positive expansions. So for instance, let's take the, the first one, take f of z is one over z plus uh, one over log one minus c. And there's various ways of proving this is positive. There's completely direct ways of proving uh, that it's positive by multiplying by z and recognizing as the integral of something. And then, uh, and then recognizing that when you take uh, uh, when you take derivatives of this in order to pull out its uh, 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 expansion coefficients, is the integral of something manifestly. Uh, it's the integral of something which is not a uh, polynomial in y uh, in, in this uh, variable y that's manifestly positive, but the integrand itself is positive manifestly between zero and one. Um, there's a more uh, more uh, sort of dispersion theoretic flavor having ways of proving that it's possible. You want to prove that this thing is uh, has positive Laurent coefficients. Well, express the Laurent coefficient as a little contour integral around the origin, um, <clears throat> which you can then deform the contour around the branch cut of this one over log one minus z. And then there's just this slightly amusing thing about the discontinuity of one over log one minus z. The discontinuity is one over L minus I pi minus one over L plus I pi, which is positive. It's one over L squared plus one, and it's something positive. Okay, so there's various uh, various ways of proving them. Um, none of them, again, especially uh, conceptual, but all of them having this flavor of something which is not completely obviously having a positive expansion, but nonetheless does for, uh, for reasons involving some slightly more hidden uh, positivity. Okay. <clears throat> And then, for instance, um, uh, once you have that, uh, uh, the rest of the argument follows. So, for instance, I, I, I told you that we also needed to show that this object had a positive uh, Laurent expansion. Um, but that one follows from the fact that, the, that, that, that this function f of z that we just defined has a positive uh, Laurent expansion. Um, this, this gadget uh, is just this f of x minus 1 over x minus f of y plus 1 over y over x minus y. And simply the fact that we know that f has a positive expansion, just uh, uh, just shoving in directly gives us a manifest positive expansion, uh, Laurent expansion in x and y. All right, so that's that's the way in which uh, this contrainical representation lets us see positivity uh, when uh, when d is uh, less than or equal to six. And I should say that when d is ten, um, it's not like it all goes to hell. It's just that you have to do more and more work. You have to do uh, you know, for any for any fixed j that you want to prove, you have to do a work that sort of grows with j uh, uh, in order to prove the uh, positivity. And essentially, it's because what happened for d less than or equal to six is that vastly more was positive than was needed. All we need is that one term in this Laurent expansion is positive. Uh, that's what the contour integral picks up, but the entire Laurent expansion is actually positive. And what happens uh, at uh, uh, when d equals 10 is that a few terms are not positive, but the ones that you need to be positive always is. And in fact, most of them are positive, but there's only a few of them that are not that you have to sort of rule out to see, uh, don't uh, spoil the argument. Okay. <clears throat> and um, finally, as I said, the... Um, uh, the asymptotics uh, are very easy to see from this contour integral uh, as well. I won't go through any of the detailed arguments, but it's really kind of very, very standard uh, uh, saddle point like analysis. Um, in the two regimes, when uh, J is fixed uh, and at large N, uh, you get uh, a very simple scaling. Um, <clears throat> uh, and also in the sort of, uh, uh, in, the, in the Reggie asymptotics, where, where n and j both become large with uh, uh, n minus j fixed. So one gets these sort of very nice uh, uh, asymptotic formulae and the asymptotic formulae work very well. So, so here's, the, here's, uh, here's what the actual residues look like. Uh, we scaled in some way, so they all fit on the spot, but the actual, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the actual residues up to, up to very high n and spin 
uh, are drawn and, and uh, in, in blue, these asymptotics at the two ends are in red and you see it, they, they, they really cover most of it and, uh, and do, a, do a pretty good job of understanding the arrest. Okay, so um, uh, uh, finally, before telling you about where this uh, double contour integral representation uh, comes from, let me just uh, say that there is a similar double contour uh, representation for all of the, uh, for all, for, for general open and closed strings. They all have exactly the same flavor with just little detailed differences, okay? So for any open strings, it has this form, but with some diff little difference for bosonic and type one, similarly for closed, similarly for heterodic. All right, but, uh, let's now finally talk in my last um, uh, 10 minutes here. Let me just uh, talk about uh, where this double contour uh, uh, representation comes from. And as I said, um, uh, I'll just, uh, I'm really just flashing the three pages of the paper. Um, uh, so if you're, if you're interested in following the argument in detail, I can at least sort of highlight what to pay attention to uh, as, as you go, go through it. Um, uh, uh, as I said, there, there's a, the, 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 the first, the, the first few pages here are just totally, totally trivial, responsible, obvious things. You okay? We begin with the integral representation, um, and now we want to pick out. Uh, we want to pick out a residue uh, at at s equals n, and um, uh, and uh, we pick out the residue at s equals n just by doing uh, just just by doing uh, a uh, just by doing a contour integral. Okay, so we actually just switch variables from z to uh, one minus z is e to the minus u. Um, and uh, so, so in going from uh, the actual amplitude to this formula for the residue, um, you see we effectively have this, uh, have this uh, uh, a one over uh, z to the n here, which is just picking out the uh, residue. Okay, so, so, so really nothing is uh, going on here. Um, <clears throat> so that's just what, uh, that's, just, that's just giving us what the uh, residue is as a function of x. Next, what we want to do is um, is integrate this against the um, Gegenbauer polynomials, and we use the Rodriguez representation of the Gegenbauer polynomials. Okay, now um, for any old um, for uh, for a random uh, function, if you want to expand a random function in Gegenbauer polynomials, okay, here it is. So I have to uh, the the uh, if the function is f of x, the jth coefficient is just the integral against the uh, the jth Gegenbauer with the usual weight of uh, f of x. But when you use the Rodriguez uh, representation, um, the Rodriguez representation writes the Gegenbauer as the jth derivative of something. And so you can integrate by parts j time so long as uh, f is, uh, isn't singular at the uh, edges uh, to get this, uh, this other representation uh, for fj now involving uh, something very simple now, just one minus x squared to some power, but now j derivatives of f at x instead of f at x itself. Okay, so when we apply this to, uh, to our particular uh, representation, uh, that's how we encounter this uh, nice, uh, uh, oh, so, so then, um, uh, then uh, uh, we use our form for the residue and we do the integral from minus one to one. Um, <clears throat> And we're left with uh, this form here down, down here in equation 3.9. But uh, all I want you to see from here is that we still have the, the same, this e to the u minus one to the n, you know, is really coming from the one over v to the n, picking out uh, the pole from the world sheet integral. And we get this interesting kernel, um, which has this one minus d squared to the j, that's the echo from the Rodriguez doing the, uh, uh, and, uh, and this, uh, uh, and the total derivative, uh, uh, the J total derivative uh, trick to go from the uh, the basic representation integrating as Gegenbauer's to this uh, new one. Okay, so uh, and finally, there's a there's a little point here already, um, which is that uh, <clears throat> uh, here there is a sum of two terms. Uh, I do the integral from minus one to one. Uh, of, of just this exponential, so that's why I could, I could I could do this integral from minus one to one is simple to do. But there's two terms from the boundaries, but that's also easy to see that there's a parity symmetry, a sort of u to uh, to minus u that 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 tells you that either of these two terms cancel, and that's why the residue is zero uh, for the wrong parity, or they're equal, uh, and so we go to this last uh, uh, simple form. Okay, so up to this point, nothing has happened. Everything is just, you know, what you would do if you're a, 
if you're a third year uh, undergrad doing this uh, exercise. Um, but now something magical happens. So, and the magical thing is this interesting identity. Okay? There's this interesting uh, identity. You see, uh, you're, you're, you're still left with an integral of some complicated looking thing. This one minus d squared acting on this exponential looks like, uh, I mean, if you just, just try to do it by, by expanding that differential operator, it doesn't look especially simple. Um, but there's a, there's a sort of a wonderful identity that, uh, that lets you get rid of the one minus d squared there and just turn it into j derivatives again. Um, and we give various derivations of this in the paper. It's not that hard. You go to, uh, you use uh, the Laplace Fourier representation and, and after a little bit of work, it becomes, uh, it becomes obvious. So we give, we've given sort of two or three ways of, uh, of understanding this one way or the other in the uh, paper from different starting points. Um, uh, I, will, I will interpret it one way in a second, which seems the sort of most pregnant with possible meaning to me, uh, but, um, uh, but uh, anyway. Uh, uh, so if you're following along the, uh, uh, in these pages, this is where something interesting uh, happens. And this is what lets you keep on going. Okay, so now, now because it, we, we get J derivatives again, uh, I had something that already looked like J, uh, taking a jth derivative. That was what the first contour integral looks like. But I get, J, I get a jth derivative again, which I use integration by parts uh, to represent as um, in, in, this, uh, in, uh, in, in the form of uh, 3.12 here. And uh, so the second jth derivative is something I write as a second contour integral. Um, and what's kind of remarkable when all the dust settles is that you get our contour integral representation, but there is now a symmetry between these u and v variables that is just completely, un, you know, uh, u came from the world sheet. V is something that sort of uh, came in um, in uh, 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 in 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 the act of uh, uh, doing these manipulations, and there's absolutely no reason there had to be a symmetry between u and v. But what's remarkable when everything is all said and done, you get an expression of this complete symmetry between u and v. Of course, again, uh, you have to do the contour integral in this particular order, but it's just um, uh, yeah, that's that's what's uh, striking about. It. All right, so. Uh, it's very likely that that, that last five minutes uh, maybe even hurt more than it helped, but uh, I didn't just want to leave the, uh, the, this, this, this formula with no uh, clue of where, of where, where it came from. Um, and if I, if I can say one of many ways I said of uh, describing what this, um, what, this, uh, 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 what this identity is, one way of phrasing this identity is that in the left and right hand sides there are these there are two kind of very simple generating functions that are simply Laplace transforms of each other, um, and uh, and uh, so uh, so sort of seeing that this is true is um, is a little bit of work, uh, but that's uh, but that, that but the, the 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 basic the basic fact really does involve doing uh, 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 thinking of. Uh, uh, Thinking about the left-hand side in the in a transformed basis in a Laplace transform basis relative to the right-hand side. Okay, so um, so uh, just to say a couple of uh, uh, final comments uh, that this final expression I said already is a double contour integral um, has a remarkable symmetry between u and v and we have no idea why and um, and. Uh, uh, I think it's begging for a much more conceptual explanation and derivation, certainly than the one that we give. Okay, so um, uh, I see that I'm basically out of time, so I don't think I'll have the time to, to say something about uh, uh, Lorentzian amplitudes and the transition between uh, strings and black holes at uh, high energies, um, but maybe I'll just uh, thank you very much and uh, leave it at that and see if there are any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much Nima, for the nice talk. Uh, uh, let's see if I have questions now. By the way, Nima, this... Uh, I have a question, but I don't this, know how to This talk has been recorded. Is it okay with you to, to make it available? Oh, sure, sure. Well, I, I, didn't know, I, didn't realize, I didn't realize how to raise the hand. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.
you have two other, they're not so directly related perhaps, but one is about this meriomorphic, uh, that is accumulation points you were mentioning quite at the beginning of the, po yeah. of, of the talk. Is there any theory or something, you know, that would have such a property that we know of? That you would you have mean a theory, uh, a theory with uh, a theory that has accumulation points or right. something in, in string theory? Yeah. Oh yes, the hydrogen atom. Yeah, but I Any, mean one that they would like to do scattering with or something like that. Yeah, huh? well, if you do scattering with the hydrogen atom, it'll have it'll have poles. Uh, you know, it, it'll have the poles that correspond to the bound states with uh, accumulation points. Mm -hmm. But it's not like an alternative to, to string theory, some fundamental theory. Oh, no, 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 right, right. So what, what I'm saying, it's definitely no problem to have accumulation points because it just says that, well, you have a bound state. So, 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 so the states pile up and then beyond that energy, you ionize. So something new happens, right? Yeah, yeah, but, no, uh, fair enough, yeah. Um, so, uh, so this amplitude, I mean, uh, there's this amplitude, it's called the Kuhn, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called the Kuhn amplitude. And mm -hmm. if, if you take the, um, uh, it's very simple to, to describe. If you take the infinite product formula for the gamma functions in, 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 the, in the string amplitude, so mm -hmm. you have m squared equals n, right? So the nth level, m, m n squared equals n. In, if instead of writing m squared equals n, you write m squared equals q to the n minus one over q minus one, then as q goes to one, of course, m squared equals n. But if you just replace in the formula, you, you replace in Veneziano uh, n with q to the n minus one over q minus one, you get the Kuhn amplitude. Um, I see, I see. So that, that, one expression, that expression has it has an accumulation point because uh, sorry, and you have to have q less than one. Uh, so because if q is, is is less than one and and uh, and n goes to infinity, m squared never gets bigger than one over q minus one. Okay, so so all all, all all the poles uh, accumulate. But it's a remarkable observational fact that that also has a positive expansion, um, and uh, we haven't tried to see if it's possible to prove it. Um, uh, from the same kind of arguments that I gave in this talk. There was a nice paper by Tjorkin uh, around the same time as ours that uh, was exploring this uh, from other, other points of view. So it would be right. something okay. interesting to look at. It looks yeah. like, I mean, I mean, I'm making a very superficial comment, but it looks like some kind of Q to, I mean, it is a Q deformed version of the beta function. So mm -hmm. maybe there's a Q deformed uh, world sheet that I don't know. Uh, I see, I see, yeah. but, right. but physically, you might be looking for some kind of background where the string can grow, 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 but past a certain point, it has to snap. Um, you know, so if there's some physical way of finding something like that, maybe that would have uh, an amplitude of this form. But you wouldn't have a contour representation of the S matrix anymore in that case. No, that would be from, or the, um, sorry, of the amplitude, because you couldn't write as a, it's not very amorphic function then, so you couldn't yeah, write that's as right. a Yes, yes, that's right. But okay, that's that, right. that can be yeah. the case. All right, thank you. So, uh, are there more questions? I, I do not, have another question. I think we're going to finish I, right on time. Ah, okay. I do have one more question. <laughs> okay, sure, <laughs> let's go ahead. If Nima can do it, because he said yeah, he had a uh, short. It'd be, it'd be very short. Yeah. 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 Just curious, because I think it was, I think you know this much better than I, but I think it was more or less known that if you assume the function is meromorphic, that you need an infinite number of states and you need uh, the masses yeah. need to be growing, but that the integer spacing was always an open problem. Is there oh, any yeah. progress? And do, do you think there's any progress? In, no, uh, no yeah. I mean, uh, you see, my, my, my attitude about this, uh, I mean, there, there's, been, there's been some, uh, 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 there's some very, very nice work by uh, uh, Komargotsky, Sever, yeah, I know that, yeah. and uh, Jibadev that showed that in the, in the limit, in the unphysical limit where the amplitude grows exponentially, it has to have the sort of universal Veneziano-like form, and so that right. uh, that that tells you that sort of asymptotically, uh, this kind of spacing is uh, is the correct. But why it has to be in general is not uh, is still not. open. Yeah, yeah. My, you know, uh, my 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 interest in a sense from the beginning was in the opposite direction right. of like yeah. uh, start in the neighborhood of the answer and try to understand why the answer works, and then maybe that'll tell you why nothing else works. But then we, we got stuck with how miraculous it was that the answer works. <laughs> so so. So, you know, we really want to understand why the hell the answer works. And we yeah. still don't really understand why the answer works. But uh, I kind of have a hope. I mean, I said at the very beginning that it, I mean, I'm not a professional uh, string theorist, but if I was a professional string theorist, it would bother me that the no ghost theorem is this one sort of piece of magic that li lies around in string theory. Everything else, nice, nice. 
confirmable anomaly cancels, responsible, very good. And then there's a sort of weirdo thing in the middle that now we prove the no-go-to. And then that's something, uh, you define that and, and ask some like, and it's not just some clever thing, you know, Borchard's used this in Monstrous Moonshine. It's, it's got some real beef to it, but it's bad to have something with real beef and real magic still 40 years later, uh, uh, still looking magical and not uh, especially conceptual. And so anyway, I, I could be wrong, but that's, that's my sort of, uh, you know, unprofessional uh, 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 view of it. Um, but that's why I was hoping that you know, maybe some more direct way of understanding it would give, I don't know, some, some different insight into what, what's going on in these uh, uh, wonderful functions. Um, and I think that this, uh, maybe there are some kind of relatively simple explanation for where this uh, double contour integral uh, uh, formula comes from. But I think whatever that explanation is, is something I would really like to know. And it might be something, it might be a, a good thing to know about uh, uh, string amplitudes in general. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think we can finish for today. Again, thank you very much, Nima, for accepting the invitation and uh, looking forward to know more about this. All right, great. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> really great to see uh, all of you. Okay. Bye bye. bye.